Okay. So now I want to talk a bit about what's hard about the writing the specific games. And I think that given the importance that I've just emphasized, um, it's already clear what's hard, right? You've got one page to sell your whole project and explain everything and all the details that you've been working out over six to 12 months and get it right and get it clear and get it detailed and get it exciting and get it everything. So that's incredibly hard in that itself. Obviously, the hardest parts are going to be all project specific. How do you do that for your specific project? And I really can't answer that for each of you. Um, but what I can do is talk about two concepts um, that are hard to do when writing, but, but give you perhaps an ability to, to think about how to do this. And I want to talk about the narrative of the, of the specific games page and, and some thoughts on focus. So with regard to the narrative, um, a narrative is, by definition, a spoken or written account of connected events, and, and it's a story. And the specific games page really should be a story. It should flow. It should take the, the reader uh, and hook them, get them excited, take them on a journey, and then take them to a resolution. And that's what's going to, to, to engage um, the reviewer. So that might be a little different than what people have told you. And you, you might say, gosh, that, that's not exactly what I heard. I heard that it's supposed to be like an elevator pitch. And you know, is that really a story? And what I can say is that you know, the elevator pitch really is a story too. And so the, this is the classic elevator pitch sentence structure that you'll find uh, you know, in any, any business uh, uh, class or text. And the elevator pitch sentence structure says, you know, for a target customer who has a certain need, I've got a product that's in this category that will have this great purpose and product that's unlike the competition, and uh, this is how it separates. And, and that really is a story too, right? So you've got a character, you've got a main character, the target customer, and the target customer has a problem, there's a crisis. And lo and behold, a hero comes in, a product uh, that has certain powers and uh, abilities that are going to save the day, save the world, on vanquish the competition, and, and the product will create a better world and make your life better. And uh, so even the elevator pitch really was, was a story. And uh, that being said, I think you can think about this that way, or you can really think about it in the classic sense of a, a narrative arc. And so if you take a creative writing class, if you ever take a creative writing class, um, or really just are a purveyor of popular fiction or popular movies, you see this narrative arc, and the narrative arc is almost all stories work, with the possible exception of a David Lynch movie or uh, a Kurt Vonnegut novel. But, um, you know, you start with an exposition, uh, something that sets out a problem, then there's a complication, a situation, and then the complication, something gets worse, some crisis uh, results, and then the hero creates a resolution, and then there's a uh, coming together and a final resolution. Um, this really maps out directly to what you can write in a specific games page. So in the specific games page, you're going to start with some kind of background. Here's what the clinical problem is. That we're going to try to solve. Here's the, ven the, the, the venue, the, the situation, and then there's a specific challenge, uh, though. That if we could only know, uh, you know, this biomarker, if we could only know this uh, uh, chemical mechanism, then we would be able to make a big difference. It leads to some overarching goal. This is the problem we're going to solve uh, by res resolving this challenge. And then there's a hero who comes in with a specific solution to the problem. And, uh, and by the way, the hero is, is you, right? So you're the one who's going to come in and save the day with these specific aims, and you're going to vanquish this problem and, uh, and lead to an impact, a, a significance, an innovation in patient care, wonderful things are going to happen for all these patients that were suffering uh, before. Um, so this is uh, uh, the arc, and, and this is the story, and you want to be part of that story and teach it. So we'll get back to that when we talk about the structure a bit. Focus, I think, is sometimes even harder to do, and, and parts of focus are easy, right? So the specific games page focuses on the specific games. If this guy, a uh, blue guy, represents the specific games themselves uh, on your specific games page, it's not hard to tell here that he's out of focus. And you can spend a lot of time wordsmithing and resolving and making very clear your specific games so that your specific aims themselves need to be incredibly focused. And that's something I think everybody would agree with, and probably pretty doable, right? I mean, you can focus your specific games and make them work and make them um, uh, very uh, doable, explicit, and, and so they're fine. That's not the hardest part of focus. The hardest part of focus is that that's not the only thing you need to keep in focus. There's also the big picture, the impact. And the impact has to not only be there, but you have to be able to sell it with enough granularity so that people can understand it. And then there also has to be enough of a backstory. There has to be enough methodologic detail 
um, so that people can trust you that you're going to be able to accomplish this even on this very, very limited page. And so ultimately, you need to have a specific games page that to the best of its ability is focused both in the way you set up the problem in the beginning, the specific games themselves, and the details that will allow people to uh, trust you and believe in you. And, and creating this depth of field to, to make an analogy to photography uh, is to marshal all, all your photographic resources to be able to have a depth of field that focuses on the specific games, but also keeps these other items uh, satisfactorily focused. And that's, that's challenging and it requires writing and rewriting and rewriting. If there is one page of your grant application that you need to share with other people, uh, with colleagues and friends and uh, probably your, your people who work in this area as well as people who work out of the area because the panel is not going to be all people who have expertise in your particular area, uh, it wouldn't hurt to actually have uh, friends and family or lay look at this as well. And this is one page that you just want to write and rewrite and rewrite until it's as good as you can get it. Um, so I'm going to suggest a specific structure for you for a specific games page. And like I said, this is this is the part that is purely a matter of opinion. There, are, if you uh, look online for other suggestions and templates, I think that this will have a lot of similarity to what you frequently see out there. But everybody has their own ideas for what makes a good specific games page. It probably varies from project to project. What makes the best specific games page? Um, so all I can tell you is that that for sure is that this is what I like and what I've seen work for other people. Uh, through different reviewers, but but there's no right answer for that. So, roughly speaking, this is the, the structure that uh, I, I would suggest for a specific game stage. Um, uh, it really follows the, the essay structure that you were taught in you know elementary school or middle school, uh, where you were told that uh, there was sort of an upside down triangle, and then a thesis, and then a body, and then a conclusion that's like a triangle as well. The the introduction starts out very uh, broad in general, and then narrows down to a specific focus. And then you have, and I, I roughly suggest that that be about a third um, or a quarter, probably, of the page, uh, probably about a quarter of the page. And then a sort of extended thesis statement that's that's really your, your goal and statement of purpose. And that's probably a quarter of a page as well. Um, and then a uh, uh, specific games themselves. Uh, blocked out and that's perhaps another third of the page and then whatever's left down there for the conclusion that starts again very specific with what you found or what you're going to find and spreads out to talk about why that is so significant and innovative and impactful. So uh, whenever possible I, I like to have a short informative title that is the title of your grant application repeated here on the specific things page only if you have space and I got to say that I, I uh, very often don't have space um, and so I, I lose it there. But I think it's helpful when you can just remind people. But if they don't, I mean, it's on the front of the grant application. They're going to see it anyway. So I think that's that's okay. But if you have space, it's nice to have the title. I would say that the title of the grant application, whether it's on the specific games page or not, should be short and concise. It is very tempting to make long, inclusive grant application titles. Uh, NIH used to have a restriction on title length that was, I don't remember, 80 characters or 100 characters, and it was very uh, limiting. Um, but that was a good thing. And now they've changed it so that it's a 200 character or something like that length, and that's less good. You know, when you finally publish in the New England Journal, they're going to make you, they're going to restrict your, your character length uh, to something less than 80 characters as well. And at first it's daunting, and then it's, you realize what a wonderful thing it is. So you want to focus a, a clear, short title. They're going to get the details when they read it, but they want to get something um, concise as a title. And then you want to have a introduction and background and section. This is where you educate people about the specific background that's needed for interpreting your grant application. You're going to identify key knowledge gaps, the needs. Why is there a problem? Why is your project necessary? And, and here, I, I think you want to be careful. You don't need to spend a lot of time talking about what a terrible disease you're treating. Um, I think you, you can assume that reviewers that are uh, brought forward by the NINDS know that uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke, uh, all of these are terrible and people know that they're terrible. They know that they are common. They know that they're um, uh, devastating. Telling people that Parkinson's is a big problem is not necessary. What you want to do is tell people why the thing that you're going to address about that disease, why your particular problem is so bad for people who have this terrible disease. You want to tell them what they don't know. Don't spend a lot of time telling them that, you know, this terrible disease, but do tell them uh, why 
it's a huge knowledge gap that people don't have don't have done your project. And then the next thing is the specific problem that you're going to be solved and the overall goal and solution uh, to the problem. So this is going to be uh, how you're going to uh, solve this problem. And that was, and I, I say that deliberately. It's not just how is this problem going to be solved, but it's how you are going to solve this problem. So this is your chance to sell not only your solution, but you as the person or team to, you know, uh, implement the solution or identify this the solution or make the solution work. This is a part where you need to tell them why you're wonderful and great and perfect as well. And that's uh, important because that's one of the scoring criteria, and it's one of the things that people are least comfortable doing. At least. I mean, there are some people who are very comfortable self-promoting, but uh, but most of us are not as comfortable self-promoting and downplay selling why we're the right team or person or group to do this. And this is not a place to be uh, modest or humble. This is this is like when you're going to promotion, you have to uh, sing your praises because no one else is going to do it here uh, if you don't. Uh, so it's going to be how you are going to overall solve this this problem. And then you go into the bulleted specific aims, and uh, I think they should be bulleted. Here, there's probably a, a much broader range of opinions on how, how these are to be structured and what the best way to structure them is. I tend to think that the right number of specific aims is three, and I don't have a great reason for why it should be three. Three is just what people are most used to seeing. It's what they're gonna be most comfortable with out the door. Two seems like often just not quite enough, and four just a little too many. I don't know why. Um, I think that if the project is right for two, then two is perfectly acceptable. If it needs to be four, it needs to be four. That's okay too, but it should have a purpose. And if you're not sure, then, then three is certainly your starting point. In clinical trials, that can be pretty hard, right? Because if you think about a clinical trial, a clinical trial really should really have one specific aim. It's the primary objective of the trial, and that's really what it's all about. So, you, you know, conceptually, you could think of just one, um, but usually you have additional information you're going to learn. You have one primary aim, you usually have secondary aims. And the structure that I think is easiest uh, to write is that specific game one is your primary outcome, specific game two is all of your secondary outcome. Here's all the other things that we're going to learn. And then I like for a third specific game then the exploratory things, the things that you're not designed to be able to answer at all, but things that you can learn about that'll uh, perhaps be a little bit more broad And now some people will tell you that that's a, a weak specific game because you can't prove it um, and it's maybe too vague. And I, I think that that's a, a justifiable criticism. That's a reason why you might want to not want to have an exploratory third aim. Um, but I think that if you have two really good solid aims first, people are going to give you some slack on that and, and let you put the things that you wanted to say that you couldn't say without overstating in your other aims. Um, so that works for me. I think you can certainly, like I said, do, do fewer or more. Um, within each specific aim, how do you structure it? I, I, I like a clear conceptual statement followed by a more detailed, specifically worded statement that is your hypothesis. You can label it your hypothesis or not, but I think that's that's what I like to see. Um, uh, some people will structure multiple hypotheses under a specific aim, and that can work. Um, I think that it tends to get very crowded and uh, indecisive. There was a, um, uh, a movie called uh, Wonder Boys, which was about a creative writer, and one of the things that he taught as a writing professor, he taught his students was that writing was all about making choices. And, uh, and then he wrote a 3,000 page novel and one of his students said, it sounds like you made no choices. So um, you do need to make choices and you do need to create a specific hypothesis that is narrowly focused. And if you do hypothesis 1A, 1B, 1C, you really run the risk of looking like you don't know what you're doing. Um, so it can be done and the right circumstances is appropriate, but I, I wouldn't be happy about doing that. Um, and then uh, I think that one of the things that a lot of specific games pages uh, miss out on, and I think is uh, a mistake, especially in the current review environment, uh, and that is not wrapping up by saying why this is significant, why it's going to change the way that things are done in this research field or the way that things are practiced in this type of patient care, um, and, and sort of saying that succinctly why this is significant and innovative, and, uh, uh, and that's because significance plus innovation plus approach are what contribute to impact. And uh, it's hard for the review division to get reviewers to focus on impact, but they're trying and they're trying and they're trying. So something that uh, uh, reviewers always like looking at methodology uh, because that's straightforward, it's easy, it's relatively objective. If something's not gonna work, they can tell you why it's not gonna work. But impact and significance really gets into the subjectivity that reviewers 
often are uncomfortable with. They don't want to say that something out of their field isn't going to have a big impact, even if they feel that way, because they feel that that's soft and subjective. But but that's what the uh, review division is trying to get them to do. And so if you can sell them again at the end on how this all resolves and gives meaning and a purpose and a value, um, that's going to be something that they might believe. And certainly if they have believed it, again, it gives that uh, sound bite for them to cut and paste into their review. So um, it's very important to, to leave with an impact. Okay, so that was the video. Let me check it. You can open it up to um, Drs. Elm or Silberglade if you want to add anything more to that. And then if you do have questions, anyone, um, you can use the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom. Well, I can tell you one thing, it's really nice to not have to give the same lecture year after year, but it's really <laughs> painful to watch yourself giving a lecture. It, it's worse if the will puts it on high speed. This is Lori Gutman. Thanks, Jordan and Rob, for, being, for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And your um, your video is so great, Rob, that we decided we would free you from having to repeat it. So um, I don't know if you wanted to reiterate any points or there is anything specific that you wanted, you guys wanted to talk about from there. If not, I have some questions and we can go from there. I can say just a, a couple things about the statistical considerations for your specific aims. Um, one thing that's very important to consider is making sure that um, as you're drafting your statistical analysis plan that it, it isn't inconsistent with what you put in your specific aims. So that's something that is going to be scrutinized by the statistical reviewer. So it, it has to be, it, don't go changing them at the last minute after you've already got your analysis plan set because if you end up getting an inconsistency there, that can be a, a somewhat of a fatal flaw. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in reviews, that does happen where, you know, you, you suddenly think, oh, maybe I could clarify this specific aim, but um, right before you send it in, right? Maybe I could make it a little more clear or maybe I should refocus it. But then when the reviewer gets into the meat of it, um, then they realize that your whole statistical plan is based on something different. So, yeah. I, I guess I can ask a couple of questions. When you're, when you're talking, you, you talked about, um, the uh, grant specific aims um, and you also in your video, Rob, you talked about objectives. Can, can you, is there, when you're talking about clinical trials, can you compare and contrast sort of specific aims and primary and secondary objectives for the clinical trial? Um, <clears throat> maybe. Uh, I, I, I actually think it's somewhat, it, it is somewhat confusing. I, I think that a trial has uh, objectives and the specific aims page is sort of, and the grant has specific aims. Um, and the, they sort of correlate, but not necessarily perfectly. And, and I sometimes do struggle with that. So the objectives I think are, are, are what I think of first. What, what is the trial meant to prove primarily? What are it's what is it meant to prove secondarily? The grant application presumably is is the same thing. So that's why I think that they match up. And I think that I, I usually like having, like I said, there's no right or wrong, but I, I like this structure for clinical trials where the first aim is the sort of matches to the primary objective of the trial. The second aim of the grant, like I said, I, I sort of like to have meet sort of all my secondary defined objectives. Um, and then third to be this sort of exploratory thing. So there's always things you want to explore, things that, you know, and, and I sort of like that, that structure. Otherwise it does get awkward. People try to do other things and we can say that the prime, you know, you can try to map the 
one specific game to the primary objective and one, you know, another specific game to a secondary objective and a third one to another uh, secondary objective and so on and so forth. But then you end up with the same number of specific games as objectives and objectives uh, quite often are many more than uh, what you would typically see as specific games. So I don't, I don't know, Jordan, do you have a framework for that that you like better? I think it can sometimes be awkward and confusing. Yeah, I I agree. I struggle with that too. Um, one of the things that I was always trained was that each specific aim needs to have its own power or sample size calculation, and that gets very tricky um, for secondary outcomes and for exploratory analyses in particular. So I do struggle with that. You know, my my preference is just have the one aim for a clinical trial that's what you're powered for and then you don't have to worry about that but i you know i i can see the perspective that you have robert that maybe it, this is your chance to present the body of the work and then the importance of it so you know maybe i'm maybe that's not the best approach I, I it's also just I, awkward because because People don't. People aren't accustomed to seeing a multi-million-dollar grant application with one specific aim. Um, so even though that can make a certain amount of sense too, it's just not what people are used to seeing. And to a certain extent, you got to give people at least something that they're familiar with. So I. I but you're right. I, I struggle with it. I'm sorry, Larry. You had another question. You know, I was just going to say sometimes what I've seen done well is as people go through the uh, the research uh, portion where they and they talk they're talking about their objectives and then they um, within the body of it will link it back to as per specific aim one or this works with specific so so that it's clear to the reviewer why they're doing certain things in the study in the studies that they're doing um, yeah the, the downside, I, I, maybe I'll just clarify a little bit what I mean about the downside is that, you know, as that, that, that third reviewer, the statistician reviewer looking at it, they're trying to match up the specific aims and, and they're really focused on the analysis section. So, you know, if you get somebody going, well, the first aim was powered very well, but the second aims were not, then all of a sudden it's a weakness. And you don't want a weakness. You don't want to build a weakness into your project. So, but it's kind of unavoidable by the way that you've set it up. So I don't know that there's a right way to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of questions when, when we were talking about this um, prior to the, to the um, webinar today. You know, we had a lot of discussion about, you know, translating objectives into aims or, you know, how do you clarify these? I, I do think it is a, it is a difficult, um, it's a difficult to, uh, to struggle with. I think the more you can clarify it in different places, probably better. I don't know. I, um, and you, you mentioned this in your video um, about specific aims and, and exploratory. Do you, I don't know if you want to expound on that a little bit more, Rob or Jordan, about uh, how many specific aims. Uh, you, hey, Jane, in, the, in the video you, you talked about it, um, you know, you don't want to have like whole laundry list of specific aims but you mentioned also you don't want to just have one especially for a clinical trial so. yeah i mean you know the convention is three right. usually right. usually you see three specific aims and so that's what people expect i don't know that that's the right thing to do all the time um uh but but that's that's sort of why I suggested that structure because that structure almost always works. If, if you try to, and I guess my, my problem with, with um, 
you know, usually the, the, I mean, so I think the thing we can start with is that just exactly what Jordan said is that aim number one should be the hypothesis that you're going to test. It's going to be powered. It's the question you're trying to answer. That's, that's the meat of the, the project. If you, if you say, gosh, there's something else that's really important that I want to make number two, and it's really just the, it's the other idea that you just, you couldn't decide between, then you're looking indecisive. It can't, it can't be an alternative version of aim number one specified slightly differently because you couldn't decide how to do things, um, which, which it often ends up looking like. And also then, I mean, my, I guess my other problem is that there might be three secondary objectives that are very important. That might be, you know, safety and uh, uh, a secondary um, efficacy outcome that are very important, but then, you know, are those separate specific aims? Because then, you know, there's sort of a, a weighting that looks like it, like if aim one was important, the aim two is important, the aim three is important, and if they're separate hypotheses, then why isn't your other hypothesis a specific aim also? So that's why I look for a way of categorizing things. Um, I, I think the third one is often a throwaway. I mean, you know, you, you probably didn't design a trial that really has three really important specific separate hypotheses that you're all powered to, to study. Um, and there's always all this stuff that people want you to look at and why didn't they look at this? Why didn't they, and usually you spent a lot of time thinking about what, could I look at this? Could I answer this? And ultimately you decided you couldn't power it or you couldn't define it or there was some reason why you couldn't answer it. And rather than that becoming a weakness, they didn't look at, the, they didn't look at it the way I would have looked at it. Then you know, being able to have an aim where he says, we're, we're going to explore, we're going to characterize, we're going to look at all the things that we couldn't design a trial to specifically answer, but that a reviewer might be interested in and getting it right up there in the specific aims strategically has the potential of working, right? It's, but it is, it's a little fast and loose and sometimes people call you on that. So there's no universally winning strategy. Um, but I think it, it gives you a place to say, we've thought about all these things and we're gonna try to answer everything but we know we can't. And so I, I think that exploratory is the, the keyword, the buzzword for that um, soft category that can either be considered a strength or a weakness depending on your perspective. So um, if anybody has questions for Rob or Jordan, uh, please put them in the chat box or um, I think that's where they should go, right, Joy? Not the Q and A. Yes, so, um, both. So, so okay. I'm, I'm I'm monitoring both. So we have one. Okay. Do you see okay. that question or two now? Okay. So the questions that we have are um, the first one is um, I want to ask your thoughts on the structure of each aim. Um, uh, is it the, also, the norm to always expect one hypothesis following each aim. Uh, I often feel that the hypothesis is just a repeat of the aim, especially for some aims such as method improvements. For example, we aim to develop or improve a certain method and the hypothesis seems to be just that this method will work better. What do you think about that? Oh. Jordan looks like she wants to go first. Okay, I was waiting for you to go first. Um, I would say I've seen it many different ways. Um, I've seen specific aims with hypothesis right after it, um, and it is often kind of a refinement of that specific aim. The specific aim might be a little bit more vague, and then the hypothesis is more specific. Sometimes it's um, not necessarily a statistical hypothesis it's more of what i might consider consider the alternative hypothesis is what you're expecting to prove um but i, I don't know that there's that it's required that it be that way robert what do you think is it do you so, prefer so i think that the, i think that it's often repetitious and i think when it's repetitious that's badly written right i mean there's no point to have repetitious you don't you certainly don't have to I think that for a clinical trial, for certainly for AIM-1, 
I think that it makes sense. But I think that, you know, the, the goal is, you know, aim, you know, aim one, the, uh, the statement of the specific aim, the aim one is to determine the efficacy of this new therapy, right? The hypothesis is that a group of patients randomized to this intervention versus this intervention will have a uh, difference in this measure uh, of a certain amount, right? So, so they, the, the, the statement of the aim should be a short, concise statement that is not going to be anywhere near hypothesis risk because the uh, hypothesis is going to be a long, multi-phrased uh, uh, declarative statement that's going to be much more specific. So uh, often they are repeated, but you shouldn't be, they shouldn't be repeated. One should be very directed and brief and to the point and impactful. And then the hypothesis is the longer unpacking of, and, and, and but it's important to have both, I think, usually, because why you chose that hypothesis structured that way might not be completely self-evident on, on a first read. It was like, you know, what, um, at the end of the day, what's that going to show? Oh, I see. So, um, so I do think that it's, it's helpful to have those two, and at least for a clinical trial for, for objective aim one. Like I said, if once you get into the secondary ones, you might not want to put all your hypotheses. So if, if the second aim is uh, to explore additional efficacy and safety outcomes, then you might not be able to put in all your additional specific hypotheses, um, and I'm not sure you need to. Uh, certainly if it gets too long, I mean, if you're spending half your page just doing a bunch of hypotheses and, and the hypotheses are all, you know, 1A is a, is a hypothesis with safety change for efficacy, and, you know, only if only one word is changing in each one because you're looking at a bunch of different things, I, I don't think that that deserves that much geography on the specific games page. I mean, people do it, it's, but I, I, I don't like those. So maybe for your example here where you said that your specific aim is looking at method improvement, and you say, for example, we aim to develop or improve a certain method, and the hypothesis just seems to be that the method will work better. I think in the hypothesis statement, you would, you would elaborate on how you're evaluating the method, so what you're measuring and what, what you're comparing to make that, you know, what would that hypothesis be in, in specific terms? I, I guess another, another question that came in was about how about including graphs in your specific aims? Highly unconventional. I yeah, I don't think I have room. I, I, I mean, I, I don't remember any rule that prohibits it. Um, and I suppose that if there was something that, but no, I, I don't think so. And so um, I think there are some examples, Joy, um, that you were, that uh, we had provided for some uh, specific aims pages. Yeah, so, so if you if you scroll up to the top of the chat, there's there's some links to examples there. Oh. Um, there's another question in the Q&A for yeah. all panelists to discuss, debate how many days per week and, or how many days, weeks, and in advance from the submission date that the specific games page needs to be ironed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, part of that, <laughs> Part of that has to do with your own office of uh, sponsored programs, right? I mean, they want it uh, usually at least a week ahead of time. So you're going to need to have it done by then, um, at least at our institution or where I am right now. And uh, I, I don't know if you guys want to address that otherwise. I wonder if the question is when in the process do you write your specific games page? Ah, okay. Well, um, that's a good way to approach it. And, and if that's the question, uh, I think it's it's hard. Um, I, so I think that it does, I think it should be written early, right? I mean, if you think about what I was saying, if it's the story of what you're going to do, 
the earlier you understand your story, the better your project's going to be. Now, sometimes your story does change as you work on your project. You know, you, you realize that, that things need to change. But the, the more that the specific games is about what you really want to accomplish, um, I think it's really helpful for it to be a very early document. Um, it's, it's really how we, I, I, I think I start writing the project. Um, and a lot of people do, I think, and I, I agree with that. Now, you do need to refine it as you go along, and you do need to do like Jordan said and make sure that it, your project and your specific games, your story and what you're going, what you actually propose to do, have to stay consistent. So there's there's an iterative uh, element to it, but um, it, it's it's very different than say the abstract of a, a manuscript, right? So a lot of people try to write the abstract of the manuscript before they write the paper, and that doesn't work for me. So there, you know, for when you're writing a manuscript, I think you have to write the manuscript. And then after you've written the manuscript, you summarize it in the uh, abstract. I think that that works much better. Not not so for a clinical trial and a, and a grant, at least in my mind. Yeah, someone is asking for clarification about the specific aim. So the understanding is the specific aim is your research question and should be focused on that. And asking if that is the correct understanding. Yes. Yeah. 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 As opposed to what? Yeah. I think that is, um, I think that's, I mean. I guess to, to make it opposed, as opposed to an overarching goal, you know, curing cancer is not a specific aim. Curing cancer may be your, your, your overarching goal but your specific aims should be the specific research questions that this grant application is going to answer toward that larger goal. So the specific aims mm -hmm. page before the specific aims should talk about that larger goal, that overarching, and, and how this is an important step toward it. But specific aims is what you're going to specifically answer. Yeah, I think, it, and um, Yemi actually had written a, a nice summary. So the aim is, literally what you're hoping to find in the hypothesis is a question that maybe drives that aim um and um and uh then you go on to your secondary aim or what you want to what you else you want to achieve besides that primary question um and i, okay. I will say too that um for early development clinical trials i find writing a good specific aim is really often very challenging because what you want to do is to demonstrate that your your treatment works so that it's efficacious but often you're not at that stage that you're doing a kind of trial that can answer that question so um you know you kind of you have to say that you have to say my overarching you know is to show that this works but we're not there yet this is what i'm actually going to be doing and this is how i'm testing it either it's preliminary efficacy and safety or tolerability or feasibility or whatever, but it has to be something different than the efficacy question usually. Another question is citations on a names page, yes or no? Yes. And then for implementation studies of effectiveness trials, I find my hypothesis is, yes, we can do this. How can I avoid this weak hypothesis? <laughs> well, it's not a hypothesis, a right? <laughs> I mean, the hypothesis is that, uh, you know, it, it is, is finding a good metric of feasibility. Right, so it's not yes, we can do this. It's um, yes, uh, X number. We, we will show that X number of people can be recruited with X measure of data quality, or with X retainment, or you know whatever it is you're you're going to measure. So the the specific aim will be we're going to prove that this is feasible. The hypothesis is that we're going to see a certain performance on a certain metric. And that's going to be your evidence of feasibility. If you, you know, 
if if you don't have that, then really it's the fees. It, it, it's at, so this is this is one of the um, having a lot of trouble writing a specific games and telling your story well often means that you don't have either a good story to tell or you don't know the story very well. Um, and so sometimes you might doing a really good specific game speech might let you know that you've got to either change what you're doing or um, you know don't don't go in and just figure out how to write the specific games best to whatever it is that you have proposed doing and make whatever you propose doing intransigent um, you know fe feasibility can be we just want to do it and see what kind of problems we run into and if that's really what you're going to do then you're going to write your specific games that way. It's not going to sound very good as a specific games, but it's because it's not really all that useful. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, it, it, it could be. Sometimes you just got to try something to see what the problems are, but it's, you're probably not going to get an NIH grant to, to do that. Yeah. I, so I was just looking at someone also had asked for, you know, an example of a specific aim. And I think if you click on um, what the links, you can see there's a couple of um, specific aims examples um, that I, I don't want to necessarily read right now for the sake of time. But one of the other questions that came through was about a K-23. So the question would be, um, should the final impact significance section mention the training plan on your specific aims page so the impact on the candidate's career in addition to the scientific impact or should the specific aims be purely about the science and they're wondering what mention of any of the candidates training should get on the aims page you might be able to answer that, larry i i i haven't <laughs> reviewed enough k's to um to know. I, I i would say you could mention it but the you know, there's a whole section on the training plan that where you can go into detail. Um, I think, you know, you can you can mention that it will lead to a promising career in uh, whatever area it is that you're looking at. But but really, I think it's more the specific aims um, of the project. Jordan, did you have any other thoughts on that? I, I would that's that's probably how I would as a reviewer be expecting to approach it more similar to the way an R01 specific aim page reads. Yeah, because there's a whole section on the training plan that I think is, is uh, important. I, I think if there, um, you can, you, you, you know, you can mention, uh, sometimes people write that, you know, it will lead to independence in this particular area as well. So there, there was a, um, a another question that just went away. I don't know where it went. Joy, did you? I didn't do anything. I think they deleted it. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. Um, th thanks for the great discussion. How do we approach a program officer to see if our specific aims fit right. in the scope of funding area? I, I mean, I, I think Robin can probably answer that if she's on. Oh, uh, it looks like she did. Oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. She did. Yeah, she, she, oh. she did. She wrote it down. Okay. Look, look on the NIH website to locate program officer and then email him or her. The big picture from NIH perspective, you would need to submit your grant at least two to three months before the due date to clear internal committee, committees for permission to submit. Right, and I, and I think it's important if, if there's anything that, you know, I, you, you, you can't say enough is it's important to reach out to the program officer. Um, it may be that um, this isn't something that NIH is going to be interested in and you're going to put a lot of time and effort, especially like f um, for certain, um, if, if there's not a clear, you know, a request for, uh, appli for applications for grants for a particular area, if this is an area of your interest and you don't know if the institute is in interested, better to ask months in advance um, and start the conversation. They may also be able to direct you. I found 
program officers over the years to be very helpful in sort of saying, well, you know, this particular area is not so much, but if you look at it from this direction, it might be more interesting to us. I don't know if either of you have anything to say add to that. No. Okay. Do we have another question here? Um, so somebody asked to repost the links um, that sure. they can't see them for some reason. I will put them in the chat again. Okay. Thanks, Joy. If there aren't any other questions, I don't know if we want to um, just kind of recap a little bit, I guess, or we could, I think we have another, do we have a short video, Joy? Yeah, I'm not sure if we have time for the video though. Let me see how long. Oh, you're right, you're right. Well, it says it's four minutes. Oh, is it four? Okay. I have it here. Um, Okay. You want me to um, maybe we should well, maybe we should just do a recap. So, um, so I guess in conclusion, I mean, one is always to try to be as clear and concise, right? Um, that's always a good advice. <laughs> but um, you know, start out by writing your specific aims. Um, to really clarify your question. One thing you didn't say, Jordan, that I'm surprised you didn't say is get your biostatistician involved earlier rather than later, right? Say so I work too much with Chris Coffey. So he's beating that into my head. Uh, um, and make sure that you're powering things appropriately. And, and it goes, but in, and, and I mean, it, it is, I don't want, you know, it's not just rehashing. It's not just getting them involved early. It's that um, as you're writing this story, your biostatistic, the, the biostatistic, they're, they're not a little add on thing that we do to check things at the end. Um, the statistical design of the study is the telling of the story, right? I mean, it's, it's fundamental to right. what it is that you're trying to answer and how you're trying to answer it. And if you if you take it as a sort of separate activity that's glued onto the back after you figured out what you want to do, it's going to be it's 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 going to end up not being right. It's not going to be compelling. It's going to cause you to change, go back and change things in a weird way that doesn't quite answer the question. It just everything falls apart if that um, if the statistics are not. I mean, it's it's the design of the trial. It's the design of the question. It's 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 got to be part of that writing that specific games page. It's don't you don't take a specific games page and give it to a statistician and say fix it. Um, uh, or power it, right? Or power it, right? I mean, it, it, it's because the question, the the, the thing that the statistician is going to help you with is what is it specifically that you're asking? You know, how are we going to answer this specifically? And and that gets back to this notion of having. Uh, having a narrative that makes sense in the first place. Um. Yeah, I mean, starting your starting the conversation with the statistician, you know, I think that's one of the things that happens in the course that is so helpful um, is that, you know, you start out by saying, you know, this is my idea of what I want to study. And the statistician says, it's going to take a million bazillion people to answer that question. Is that really the question that you need to answer? Is there something else that is in the same area? Or that is there another way to approach this to at least guide um, the next step? So maybe your, your initial question is too big because you don't have the preliminary data, or maybe your question is impossible to answer um, with the type of study that you're thinking of. I don't know, Jordan, you can correct me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think a statistician will definitely help you wordsmith the specific aims and hypotheses. So because I, I think we want to make sure that they are consistent. So I second that. 
right? But I do think it is the it is the key to the rest of um, the the rest of your proposal, right? The specific aims page. It's really the key, um, and uh, if that if you can't take that and you know take the two parts, your research strategy and your specific aims, and match them up. Um, it's a problem and that's why you have to, I think what you were saying, Rob, is of working through that whole specific aims page initially um, to clarify your questions, then the rest of it just kind of flows out from it. Um, and uh, another point from Robin was that if you're early in your career, a smaller question is a better way to start than a bigger question. Hire a plane for yeah. yeah, absolutely. But I, and I think that you know, like I said, if you if you keep the aims, if you pay attention to if you're if you're writing the aims page well, it will also keep you from getting transfixed on one part of the the story, right? So it's very easy to get so mired down in the methods that you lose track of the big picture, um, and you forget why you why you started down this path in the first place you get you, you you went down here for a particular reason but then to solve the methods problem you started tweaking a bunch of different things and you lost sight of why you were doing it in the first place um so if you if you can write the page where you like i said have that depth of field where you can sort of pay attention to your methods but not be driven by them let the methods be driven by your specific purpose and let your specific purpose be driven by the larger questions and context um, if you can keep that in mind while you're writing the page, then you can keep this in mind when you're doing the work. And uh, it's very easy to get distracted by the, either the details or the big picture and not pay attention to the math, not, not pay enough attention to the detail or vice versa. So. Great. Well, um, I think that uh, Joy posted the links again, and also, if you would um, please uh, put an evaluation in. We we uh, have this has been an interesting year for our clinical trials methodology course, and as we think about what we may or may not be able to do next year, um, your feedback on each of these webinars has been very important to us. So. Please, um, please fill out the form for feedback and um, also um, you can get CME that way if you would like. So, and I also wanted to just remind everyone that our next webinar is September 1st on adverse event and safety reporting. So stay on the lookout for an invitation going out um, within the next couple of weeks. Right. And, and a record, yes. Go ahead. Yes, it's September 1st, um, okay. and, and a recording of this webinar will be posted on our webinars page um, within the next couple days as well, so. Great. Jordan and Rob, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And thanks to sure. uh, Joy, Yummy, and Robin as well. Thanks a lot. See thanks you guys. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.